The Minnesota Timberwolves just capped off one of the most impressive defensive seasons in recent NBA history. With multiple candidates for all defense, the heavy favorite for defensive player of the year, and buy-in across the board, they were just one game away from topping an extremely competitive Western Conference despite having an average offense. And how does such a great year get rewarded? A first round matchup against a team that seems to be their kryptonite, the Phoenix Suns. In three games this season, two of which came in April, the Suns took all three in convincing fashion, to the point where as the sixth seed, they're actually heavy betting favorites to win this series. With an offensive rating of 125.4, production at face value suggests they're immune to Minnesota's brilliant defense. But what if there's something else going on? Sample size is one of the most important factors to consider when looking into any type of data, and that's because anything can happen when it hasn't yet stabilized. That's why you'll oftentimes see some of the worst teams take out contenders in random games, why March Madness is so unpredictable and often leads to Cinderella stories, and most importantly why the NBA has adopted a 7-game series format. And when looking at just those three games of the Suns and Wolves, the stats tell a pretty interesting story. Let's take a look at Phoenix's season averages and how they compare to games against Minnesota. Their offensive rating jumped by 8 points, a massive increase, yet they shot about the same amount of shots at the rim at a similar percentage, attempted considerably less free throws, and while they turned the ball over less, they also grabbed less offensive rebounds, so the possession game remained virtually unchanged. Most importantly though, they had the exact same shot quality. In your opinion, does this look like the signal of a team that should be producing significantly better offense? Well, that becomes easy to explain when you incorporate 3 point percentage, a scorching 48.8%. Now some will look at that and draw the conclusion that the Wolves have not defended the three-point line well, so let's take a look at some of these makes. Of course we know they like to play a lot of drop coverage, and against a team with so many talented pull-up shooters that's a dangerous game. The Suns make this even tougher to defend by adding off-ball action as well. Like here, Allen runs through and clears out to the wing, where he finds space to comfortably catch and shoot. Ghost screens are another big staple for them, and the Wolves absolutely cannot blow coverages because Allen just capped off one of the all-time three-point shooting seasons. And just like in the pick and roll, a third player getting involved makes this so much tougher. This time when Allen ghosts the screen, it's to run off a flare from the big, which results in one of his practice jumpers. The difficulty is that these actions can be run for anyone. On this one, it's Durant who sets a ball screen before running off a flare, and Gobert's once again back in that deep drop where he really needs to be up a lot higher to at least make KD think twice. Well, this time Rudy does come all the way out in a blitz, putting the backline defense in rotation, where two passes end with the same result on an open KD3. In other words, yes, the Suns have done an incredible job of exploiting some of the rare weak points in this Wolves defense, and as a result have created a large sum of quality threes. But just because the looks are good, doesn't mean there isn't still some shooting luck or variance involved. NBA.com defines open threes as shots where the closest defender is at least 4 feet away, and over the entire season, Phoenix has hit just under 39% of these opportunities. A good mark, and for some reason, the NBA has yet to update numbers for the most recent game, but in matches 1 and 2, they shot a scorching 46%. That's worth noting because Game 3 was actually their best shooting night, so we're probably looking at a mark closer to 50. The reason I think this is so important in predicting a playoff series is because you can't reasonably expect them to sustain such elevated shooting over 7 games. It's happened before, so if it happens this time, it's not like I'd be surprised, but I don't think it should be at all an expectation. With that in mind, let's go back to those offensive numbers from earlier. If everything stayed exactly the same, except instead of that 48.8%, the Suns hit their season average of 38.2, the offensive rating would plummet from 125 to a 115.8 a 10-point swing just from hot 3-point shooting, and we haven't even gotten into Minnesota's offense. 
But real quick before we get into that, I want to give a huge shout out to DraftKings for sponsoring this video. The NBA playoffs are here, and if you're looking for a place to get in on the action, look no further than DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, all new customers who place a bet of just $5 on anything will instantly receive $200 in bonus bets. Let me repeat that. If you place $5 on any wager, you will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. In addition to that, DraftKings is offering a no-sweat NBA bet for all customers every single day during the playoffs. And getting started is simple. All you have to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today, sign up with my promo code HOOPVENUE, and from there you make your picks. Maybe you're feeling a same-game parlay. Maybe your favorite player or team has a favorable matchup. Like I said, all new customers who sign up with my code and bet $5 will instantly receive $200 in bonus bets with a no-sweat bet for anyone returning. One more time, that's promo code HOOPVENUE in all caps, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. If we do the exact same exercise that we did earlier with the Suns, but for the Wolves, offensive numbers can be very telling. Bar none, their efficiency has sucked in these games. They've been able to get to the rim more, but have struggled finishing, which I'll talk more about later, but that added rim pressure also led to more free throws. Another thing I'll get into in a bit is the increase in turnovers, really struggling to take care of the ball, which comes with a sharp increase in offensive rebounding, so once again not much difference in the possession game. Just like Phoenix, their shot quality has remained the same, leaving one final category that continues to pop up, a near 10% fall off in 3 point shooting. The common argument would be the inverse of everything I talked about on the other end. What if Phoenix just defended the three-point line really well? One thing that immediately stood out after watching back those games is that the Suns blew a lot of coverages that they ended up getting bailed out of. Like here, they're going to try to switch this top of the key action, but a slight miscommunication leaves Cat on the perimeter, and with an up fake, he's got the best possible look. That's a shot they want 10 out of 10 times. Here's an even better example. All it takes is a backdoor cut from Alexander Walker to pull two defenders with him, which leaves McDaniels on an island in the corner, but the jumper just simply doesn't land. I think the most important variable in this equation is Anthony Edwards though, and his ability to put pressure on the rim before finding open shooters. Once again, you want Nas Reed taking this shot every single time, and what I'm focused on is matchups. The Suns do not have a single point of attack defender quick enough to stay in front of Ant, and without a vertical presence at the rim, he's often drawing early help, to which the supporting guys just have to make shots. You'll see a lot of possessions where the wings have to load up early to preemptively take away his driving lanes, and they lead to high quality spot up threes for great shooters. That also means in the pick and roll, he's usually going to be met with coverage at the level, which draws Durant over from the weak side corner, and with the defense in rotation, the ball gets swung before once again finding Cat, who barely even grazes the rim. At one point, Phoenix even went to a zone, and Minnesota's process is perfect. They overload the weak side to make Aaron Gordon defend in no man's land, and that results in a warm-up jumper for Ant, which by now I think you know the result of. It's truly hard to put into words how bad Minnesota's shooting luck has been in these games. Just take a look at how the roster has shot across the board on open threes. They've got one of the best spot-up shooting rosters in the game. Ant and McDaniels are the only two shooting below 40%, with two of their big men up at 42%, and of course Conley leading the way with 45%. They've got options, they've got the rim pressure to create them at volume, and as a result have knocked down almost 40% as a team on the season. Whatever you're expecting in the Phoenix games, it's worse. Again, we're missing game 3, but in those first two, it was a depressing 24%. And it's not like either team had a big time advantage in the amount of open threes created. The Wolves attempted 50 to the Suns 52, so not much disparity. Let's take it back to that graphic of Minnesota's production. Just like earlier, if we adjust their three-point shooting to their average on the season, the offensive rating jumps from a measly 109 up to 117.5, which is actually above what they typically score. Even more importantly though, it's almost two points higher than the adjusted Phoenix number, actually giving them the upper hand, even if slight. 
but that's a small margin, so let's really dive into it. On the Suns' side of things, some of what they do offensively feels like a nasty counter to the Wolves' style. Let's start with the obvious. One of Minnesota's goals is to concede the mid-range, and Phoenix has three of the best mid-range scorers in the game, including arguably the two most prolific on the planet right now drop coverage, mid-post isolation, off-ball, surgical mid-range shot makers could prove to be difficult. Also, the way they structure their lineups can make things really difficult for Cat. With KD starting at the 4, Towns often finds himself having to chase Grayson Allen around screens or defend one of the star wings in space. Whereas most teams allow him to play like a secondary rim protector, the Suns force him into the role of an agile wing. As a result, I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of his minutes get cut for Alexander Walker, to which you're now sacrificing qualities like spacing, offensive creation, and rebounding. While we're on this topic, I also think KD at the 5 minutes could be a potential X-factor. They've gone to it on occasion for offensive juice, and against a team that runs two slower-footed bigs, I wouldn't be surprised if they catch fire and start to run circles around them, whether that's through stretching Gobert, pushing pace, or even just having an extra perimeter creator on the floor who can attack with the ball. With that said, I don't think they quite have the rim presence to give their offense a super high floor. I really like Beal as a driver, but he seems hesitant to score through traffic and is usually hunting for passing opportunities, while Booker can get into the defense but would rather pull up for his short mid-range game. And then the bigs aren't exactly above the rim threats, rather middle of the floor passing and screening hubs who can connect the offense, yet don't really generate much pressure. For that reason, I think they sort of rely on outlier shot making at times. If that 3 point percentage falls, I worry about how much offense they can sustain, and if that mid range shot diet will be able to produce enough to give them a strong enough advantage to overcome it. One thing that really bodes well in that regard is that they actually shot the ball very poorly in their second matchup of the season, yet still squeezed out a win in a very much grinded out type of game that saw both teams finishing in the double figures. And that's primarily a result of Minnesota having some clearly exploitable offensive flaws of their own. Although much improved, Ant still isn't near the top tier when it comes to processing the defense as a decision maker and delivering tough passes, which the Suns have taken advantage of through aggressive helping strategies. I mentioned how they've loaded up on his drives, also in passing lanes, especially in the pick and roll, which has taken away a lot of the Wolves' easy opportunities for a roller like Gobert. That's a big catalyst for the big drop-off in field goal percentage at the rim that I earlier mentioned, and it also led to some of those really high turnover numbers, as a result of having nowhere else to go. They have a ton of good decision makers, but those guys aren't really shot creators, more so connectors, and the team relies a ton on Ant's ability to break down the defense. While that worries me in a lot of matchups, I actually think the Suns are one of very few teams who can't prevent the Wolves from consistently creating advantages. It comes back to what I talked about earlier with the lack of point of attack defenders, especially from guards, and a lack of verticality around the rim. They have a real tough time preventing Ant from getting to the paint, so as long as Minnesota shooters are hitting, I feel good about their offense. Another key could be whether or not they're able to counter those potential KD at the 5 minutes. Gobert and Cat have to be working on the glass, catching the ball with deep position, and forcing the Suns to either foul or get a big back on the floor, because if they don't, they're in trouble. All that's to say, I can see a very clear path to a comfortable win for both teams. If Phoenix can force Ant into tough decisions while going small without getting punished, they can ride the shot making of their roster to a win. But if the three ball isn't falling, things could look ugly in terms of offensive floor. The same goes for Minnesota. I think Ant's rim pressure will be there, I just really think the determining factor of this series will be whether or not the supporting players knock down shots. Considering who the shooters are and how they've looked all season, I feel really confident that over a 7 game series they can string together 4 wins, especially with home court. So although the Wolves haven't beaten the Suns since Mikhail Bridges was on the roster, I think they have the advantage. 
I know a playoff series can be like a boxing match in the sense that styles make fights, and the evidence from this season may point you in one direction overwhelmingly, but I still believe that over the course of the season, Minnesota was a considerably better overall team, especially against tough competition. And when you dive into the context of how the Suns beat them, it doesn't feel like such a lopsided matchup to me. My pick, officially lock it in, is Wolves in six, maybe seven games, although like I said, anything can happen, and this might just be the first round series I'm most looking forward to. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of this matchup. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.